Independence has never been easy. Nearly 250 years ago, the idea of a people who stood on equal footing, free to speak, free to wander, free to live. These were ideals worth risking everything for. Today, we find ourselves fighting old battles, not with past foes, but with ourselves. We are a nation divided, divided by skin, divided by opinion, divided by hate. It seems the very freedoms we once fought for have become stumbling blocks. Are we too busy seeking ourselves to even recognize the tragedy which surrounds us? Do we no longer see the profound need for the hand of God? In this moment, the truth of scripture rings especially true. If we, the people, will humbly pray, turn from wickedness and seek his face, then he will hear us. He will forgive us, and He will heal this land. Today, may we remember this one simple truth. True independence is found only in our dependence on God. Happy Fourth of July to all of you. Uh, it's been, if you look at the last 12 months, it's been a somewhat crazy, stressful uh, year in many ways, and yet we have much to be thankful for. Um, despite the turmoil, despite the COVID, despite all of the things that have been going on in our nation, um, we can stop and pause and give God thanks for the blessings that we enjoy, for the freedom that we have. Um, and God has been good to us in so many ways. And I'm especially grateful this morning for the freedom that we have to gather together as God's people, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of worship. And that's something that we shouldn't take um, for granted or take lightly, as many Christians in other parts of the world don't have that same freedom that we enjoy this morning. So I'm glad that you're here this morning. Uh, we welcome you to our um, service, and we look forward to worshiping together. Just a couple of announcements to highlight. Uh, we're continuing our um, school supply drive through next Sunday. Um, we have an opportunity to have an impact on families in our Perry Township community. And uh, most of you know by now that we've donated a number of backpacks to the school, and we're also collecting supplies. And there's others who are participating in this, but this is an opportunity for Perry Township schools to help meet some of the basic needs of um, lower income families um, in the schools or those who have need. And so um, thank you for giving so far, and we pray that um, what we give and how we share will be a blessing to others. So there's a, still a list out there, and you can still bring some donations by next week. We also have a, a July blood drive coming up. It's on Monday, July the 19th. And you can pre-register. You've been getting emails about this, so um, go back and look at your announcement emails. Uh, there's a website where you can pre-register. There's a couple of... Um, for those of you who are more techie than I am, there's a couple of posters out there, and I think they have a, a code that you can scan, and it'll take you there, and you can get registered. But if you want real personal treatment, talk to Jerry or Diana after the service, and they'll be happy to, to help you. So this is an opportunity we have to, um, to give blood. And Jenny and I are going to participate in that, um, even though the last time and only time I've donated blood um, I almost passed out, and they had to bring a fan and put it on me, give me orange juice to drink. She was done in five minutes. My blood is slowly trickling out. Uh, Twenty minutes later, I was done, but I'm going to try it again. Um, now that I'm more mature, maybe I'll be able to uh, 
give blood better than my previous experience. So uh, we encourage you to be part of that, um, and you can schedule a time on that Monday. And then last of all, we have a membership discovery class for those who are newer to the church and want to learn more about our church and how we operate and our ministries and what it means to be um, a committed part of the church and be a member of the church. Uh, that will be on Saturday, July 24th, uh, from 9 in the morning till 11.30. Uh, we will have donuts and coffee and juice and so on. There's a sign-up sheet out there at the Welcome Center. Let's bow our heads together and pray as we uh, begin our service. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come and worship you today. Thank you for the freedom that we enjoy in this country. We pray your blessing on our nation through much turmoil and stress over these past 12 months. Um, you are still with us and you are helping us. May we as your people be an example of your love and grace and mercy um, to a world around us that needs that so desperately much. We want to lift up your name today. Um, you are the one who sets us free, and uh, our freedom, our peace, our joy is found in you. We thank you for that. Bless our time of, of celebration and singing and communion and open up our hearts to your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Please stand with us. With me, I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. Yes, 
captives free amen so good so good so good you are not a god created by human hands you are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are not a God created by human you are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You were on your throne. God alone, and right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne, you are God alone, you're the only God who's power, none can contend, you're the only God who's The only God who's worthy of everything we can give. You are God, and that's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You were on your throne. You are God alone, and right now.
get to come around the table together exactly as if we're a family coming together for supper. It's all because of what Jesus did on the cross. That's what our freedom, where our freedom comes from. He sets captives free. I'm one of them. And we all have stories, don't we? Let's go to the cross and worship him. seated if you would. In Matthew chapter 8, we read a story of when Jesus was teaching some of the 
crowds, and it talks about the fact that there were many of the Jews who were considered to be children of Abraham um, who believed in him. And this is what he said to those group of people. He said, to the Jews who believed in him, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, well, we are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus went on to say that we are all slaves to sin, and that a slave doesn't have a permanent place in the father's house, but a son does. And he goes on to say, so if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And I thought about that um, statement there, and I thought, you know, if we tell people in our nation and in our community that, um, you know, if you know the truth, if you know Jesus, the truth will set you free, there would be some who would probably answer in a similar way to what Abraham's descendants, and they would say something like, well, we're Americans, of course we're free. What do you mean that Jesus will set us free? And obviously Jesus was not talking about a political freedom, was not talking about freedom in the general sense that we, can, uh, we are free to come and go and do as we please. Jesus was talking about a freedom in the heart, a spiritual freedom where we are released from the bondage and the slavery of sin, which is at the root of all of the trouble and suffering and problems that we go through. And Jesus is telling us that if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And what Jesus did for us to make that possible, because it's the Son who has the authority to invite and bring us into his Father's family, what he did for us was he died on the cross to take that penalty and that burden of sin on himself so that we could truly be free. And so this morning, as we share together as a church family in communion, uh, we want to encourage you during your time of prayer and reflection to think about the fact that Christ has set you free. There may be things that you feel like are holding you down or you may be struggling with things in your life, but in your heart you can know that the Son has set you free. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus because of what he has done for you on the cross, he has set you free and you have freedom in Christ. So what we're going to do this morning is just have a quiet time of, of communion and reflection. And we invite you as you're ready, um, you can just make your way down to the communion table and in the baskets there are the communion elements and you can take um, one of those and either return to your seat or kneel at the altars and uh, we're going to share together in a few moments of this quiet reflection and communion and remind ourselves as we do it that Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks he said this is my body which is given for you and in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood which is poured out for you as a new covenant for the forgiveness of sin. And so come with thanksgiving in your hearts this morning. Take the bread and the cup in remembrance of what Christ has done for you and the freedom that you have in your heart and in your soul because of Jesus. Let's come. <laughs>
When Meredith saw my shirt this morning, she said, all I can think of when I see that shirt is the second half of the saying, be happy. Don't worry, be happy. Um, I was thinking a little older than that. Um, back in 1980, Jamaican um, singer, songwriter, uh, musician Bob Marley had a song called Don't Worry About a Thing. And the line of it goes, um, don't worry about a thing because every little thing's going to be all right. Don't worry about a thing, because, and I'm not going to try to sing it for you, but you look it up, Google it, you'll recognize that song. Uh, we, have a, we tend to think that if we can just get everything in our lives lined out, you know, everything is cool, everything is going smooth, if we stay in good health, if we hold a good paying job, um, if we keep the family happy, then we have nothing to worry about. But the reality is, we do tend to worry about these things, don't we? We tend to worry about our health. We tend to worry about our income. We tend to worry about family relationships and other things. And in our minds, I think, we have the idea that if we can just take away or deal with all of these stressors, then we won't worry. So we try our hardest to pursue happiness in hopes that it will alleviate our anxieties and our worry. The truth of the matter is, not everything is right in all of our lives. I mean, there may be those moments where just everything comes together and there's those moments of bliss, but generally, if you look at the scope of our whole lives, not everything is always right. And we do worry. And when we do that, we have it all backwards. We think that if we just get everything straight, if we get everything taken care of, then we won't worry. But Jesus starts with this premise and this teaching. He tells us first, don't worry. And it seems rather simplistic, but I think the passage that we look at today will give us some good insights into that. So I'd invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps, turn to the book of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, and Matthew chapter 6. And we've been looking at a few passages in Matthew chapter 6 in the previous weeks. And we're going to be reading today in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25 and reading through the end of that chapter. So Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store, store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more, much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. How many of you can say amen to that? Each day has enough trouble of its own. 
Now, as we look through this passage here over the next few minutes, um, I want you to notice, first of all, that there is a connection to the previous paragraph. Anytime you see the word therefore, it's referring to something that just preceded it. And so when Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, he's referring back to what he's been talking about, about not storing up for yourself treasures on earth, about the fact that you can't serve both God and money. And a lot of times we think, well, it's people who have wealth who have a tendency to obsess about how they're going to keep their wealth and how to get more, and they worry about it. So you can have a lot of wealth and still worry about how you're going to manage or keep or protect that wealth. But the same is true of people who don't have very much. People who don't have much in the, ma- in the way of material wealth and possessions, those who are, who are materially poor tend equally much to think about money. So money is one of those things that we have an obsession over that we want to control, and it's often a source of worry whether we are rich or whether we are poor. So Jesus picks up on that whole passage before about not laying up treasures in heaven, um, not serving, trying to serve both God and money, not being obsessed with the material things of this world, and he says that we should not worry about our life, and he talks about what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, and so on. People who don't have much tend to worry about what they don't have. And they worry about what they need and how they're going to get it. So whatever our status is in life, we can find ourselves worrying about things um, that we become preoccupied with. And I think that one of the reasons that people get so preoccupied with material things and with gaining wealth and financial security is because deep down inside we have this deep uh, anxiety and fear over being without. And it's common, I think, around the world. So to all of these things, Jesus says, don't worry about things like food or drink or clothes. And that may seem like a really basic common thing, but I think he's getting at a deeper issue that we can trust him. So as we walk through these verses here, there's five things that we're going to see. And we're going to see that life is more important than material things. We're going to learn that your life is valuable to God, that worrying does not add anything to your life. We're going to learn that we can trust God, and then we're going to learn that there are two ways to combat worry. So the first of those we're going to look at is in verse 25. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? If ever there is a culture and a people that need this reminder, it's us. Life is more important than material things. Let me say that again. Life is more important than than material things. We are more than the sum total of what we eat, drink, and wear. But you wouldn't know that by what you see on TV and magazines and all the advertisements on the internet, all the things that pop up about this thing that you can buy and this thing that you need. But we are more than the sum total of what we eat, drink, and wear. Our consumer society that we live in, particularly here in America, reduces life to appetite, pleasure, style, comfort, and convenience. Think about that. Everything that we're bombarded with every day reduces life to our appetites, pleasure, style, comfort, convenience. And so what does our focus tend to be? Our focus tends to be on food, diets, sex, entertainment, Clothing, houses, technology, transportation. And if you notice, all of those things, for the most part, are impersonal. They're things that we become obsessed with. And so I think as simply as I can put it, and I speak to myself in this, don't let your life be defined by merely material things. We are more than physical bodies. We are more than human machines. Life is more important than material things, and Jesus makes that really clear here. The second thing we see is in verse 26, and Jesus talks about the fact that your life is valuable to God. After he tells us not to worry about or obsess over all of these things, he says, hey, look at the birds of the air. 
They don't sow or reap. They don't store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them? Your life is valuable to God. God cares for his creation. He cares for the creatures of this world, but what Jesus is getting across is that your life as a man or a woman who is made in the image of God, your life is valuable to God. And maybe we lose sight of that because in so many ways in our world today, humans have been devalued. And you look at so many countries in the world where there is oppression and there is war and there is famine and there are uh, corrupt governments and all of that. Life is devalued, but your life is valuable to God. We matter to God. God cares about and provides for all of his creation. When we look around our world today and you see some of the many cases of, of poverty and starvation, and in these day and age, let's be honest, we've been kind of blinded to much beyond our own scope of what's been happening. We've been obsessed with COVID. We've been obsessed with the shutdown. We've been obsessed with the economic you know, recovery. We're probably obsessed now with gas prices. But around the world today, there are, there are millions and millions of people who are starving, millions of people who are living in bombed out cities. I mean, we miss a lot of what's happening. Our world is a broken and a hurting place. And in many cases where we find poverty and we find extreme starvation, it's, let's be honest, it's often man's doing. Um, it's cases of corrupt governments. It's cases of war and conflict that lead to a lack of provision and a lack of food and a lack of shelter. Oftentimes it's one man's greed that causes another man's poverty. Laziness causes a lack of productivity. Violence and war, whether it's violence in our inner city neighborhoods or conflict in other places, displaces people. We have a lot of displaced people. Um, and I, I know you know this, but you know, there's, there's 20 some thousand Burmese that live now in Perry Township. They just didn't move here because they wanted a better life. They were refugees who were forced by persecution out of their country into refugee camps in Thailand and in surrounding countries. And they, many of them, the parents, lived in those refugee camps. I mean, we're talking in tents and shelters. And they lived in those refugee camps for months and months and months, and some of them years and years and years. They had children born in those refugee camps. So when they had the opportunity through our government as under religious persecution to resettle in the United States, they jumped on that opportunity. And, uh, and they have poured themselves into working hard and building a community within the larger you know, community. And we, we see people who come and immigrate into our country, and there's arguments and disagreements over that. Even what's happening right now, you have to realize that there's such a brokenness and a pain and a suffering around the world, and people are displaced, and I, we have that suffering, and we see it on our doorsteps. The resources here on this earth are plenty. God has provided because he loves his people. You know, we read about famines in places, but we also read in the same stories that there are warehouses full of sacks of grain and food sources that aren't being delivered to people. So the problem is not that God doesn't care and God doesn't provide because your life and every life on planet Earth is valuable to God. He provides the resources Unfortunately, we as humans sometimes waste them or don't use them wisely. Your life is valuable to God. He provides. The third thing is that, in verse 27, is that worrying doesn't do anything to add to your life. If it did, we would all be living to 100 plus years old because we probably worry enough that if it added to our life, um, we would live long lives. But it doesn't. In fact, it's just the opposite. In, chapter, in verse 27, he says, Which one of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Some translations can, say, can add a single cubit to his life. You know, can you, it's not going to make you any taller. It's not going to make you any stronger. And in fact, the opposite is true. There have been enough medical studies in recent years to show that worry has a physically and mentally detrimental effect on our lives. 
Worrying and anxiety affects our health. Probably everyone, not every one of us, because some of you are really good, strong, healthy people, but I bet most of us, we've had health issues that have like, you know, ulcers, high blood pressure, things like that that could be contributed to worry and anxiety. Worry does affect your health. So when Jesus says, don't worry, he's not just throwing out this flippant little, you know, cutesy saying that, oh, don't worry, be happy. No, he's getting at something that is essential. It's when we trust in him and we let him take the anxiety out of our lives, we are better and healthier for it. Worry affects your health. It wears out your mind and it wears out your body. Anxiety, worry, and fear, at the very least, take all the joy out of your life. And there have been times maybe when you've been like that or you know someone's like that, they just have no joy. They are stressed out because they're letting worrying and and anxiety take over their lives. If you think about your past, if you're worrying about your past, it's paralyzing. If you're worrying about your future, it's a wasted effort because we can't control what happens tomorrow. In a sense, when you get down to the bottom line of this, worrying is pointless because it doesn't change a thing other than maybe our health and that's making it worse. The reality of the future, someone's, this is a quote that I read, I can't remember who said it. The reality of the future is seldom as bad as the future of our fears. Let me say that again. The reality of our future is seldom as bad as the future of our fears. We build things up in our mind, and, we get, we get, and we've seen this over the past year in a lot of regards, is that we let things so dominate our fear and control us, but yet the reality of the future is not, often not nearly as bad as the future that we fear. We imagine things to be much worse than they actually turn out. How many times have you like, I mean, I've, I've done this. I've got something built up in my mind. You know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a stressful relationship with another person and, and you're letting it build up and you're letting it build up and you dread having that conversation. And then you had that conversation. And said, well, that wasn't so bad after all. That turned, that turned out okay. The reality of the future is often much different than what we build up in our minds. The fourth thing we see in verses 28 I um, mean, following is that we can trust God. Verse 28 says, Why do we worry about clothes? Look at the lilies of the field. Not even Solomon in his splendor was dressed like one of them. If God takes care of the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, how much more will he take care of you? How much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them. So I just want you to think about this. If God knows your needs, if God knows our needs, if we are more valuable than the other created beings on this earth, if we are more valuable than the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, doesn't it make sense that we can trust him to take care of us? Doesn't it make sense that even though we don't know what tomorrow holds, that we can trust him as we walk into tomorrow? So when you think about it, worry is the opposite of trust. And if we're honest about it, when we worry, it is essentially distrust of God. And that's a hard thing for us to admit because we want to just we want to accept our own worry and say well it's just normal everybody worries about everything but worry is the opposite of trust and our tendency to worry i think is connected to our subconscious desire to be in control of our lives it's hard for us to let go and let god be in control of our lives we want to be in control of our lives And worry is maybe the evidence that we feel like we've got to hold on and we've got to be in control of all the circumstances in our lives, so we worry about it. And let's be honest. Think about this. 
we become especially anxious about the things we cannot control. We become especially anxious about the things we cannot control. As humans who are prone to pride, who have a fallen human nature that is in need of redeeming by God, there is always a subtle temptation to solve every problem, to work out every detail, to handle every situation. So if we think everything is in our hands and everything is our responsibility, it's natural to worry and be anxious. Francis Schaeffer put it this way in one of his books. He said, if I believe there is a personal God and he is my father since I trust his son Jesus, then surely when I lack trust, I am denying what I say I believe. When I lack trust, I'm denying what I say I believe. If we really believe that God is a loving father who cares for us, then we can trust him. And when we worry and when we fret over things, we're not practicing that simple trust. Now, those are, you know, kind of hard things to think about. Um, And I think one of the great passages in Philippians chapter 4, when Paul is writing, he talks about don't be anxious about anything. But, and and here's how you do that. But by prayer and supplication, bring all of your requests to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So there's the solution, is that when we're prone to be anxious and to worry, we can come to God and we can find peace through Christ. The last thing I want us to see this morning is in the conclusion of this um, chapter in verses 33 through 34. There are two ways I think in these couple of verses, two ways to combat worry. In verse 33 it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, and all these things means the things that you're worried about or concerned about, the provisions for your life, and all these things will be given to you as well. That's the first one. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So the first way that we can combat worry, looking at this passage, is we need to concentrate on the kingdom of God, focus on spiritual things, focus on our relationship with God. When we put first things first in our lives, everything else will fall into place. It doesn't mean it will be easy. It doesn't mean that there won't be problems. But when we put God first, when we seek him first, when we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, everything else falls into place. And Romans chapter 14 says the kingdom of God is right living, joy, and peace that comes through God's spirit. When we are in right relationship with God and we have joy and peace that comes through his spirit, that's what it means to live in the kingdom of God, to be part of his family. So what I want to encourage you and speak to myself about is don't just spend your life chasing after things that don't really matter. Keep your heart and your eyes focused on God and you will be find you will find that trust replaces worry and peace replaces anxiety seek first his kingdom his righteousness and all these things will be added to you and then the second way that we can combat worry is to learn the art of living one day at a time How many of you have mastered that? Anybody? (laughs) One person. How many of you have mastered the art of living one day at a time? And it's pretty logical when you think about it. Why take on more than you need to? And yet we tend to do that. Why rob today by worrying about tomorrow? We can face the challenges of today and leave the things of tomorrow for tomorrow. I mean, that's what Jesus is saying. I mean, that, I, yeah, and there's all kinds of one day at a time. Um, you know, we all know that, but we're all prone to think about tomorrow. Um, how many of you already know what you're going to be doing tomorrow? Don't raise your hand. How many of you are, how many of you have already, even this morning while you've been listening to me, are thinking about, oh, tomorrow I've got to do this. I, got a doctor's appointment. If 
we, what if we just handled the demands of each day as it comes without worrying about the unknown future and without worrying about things which may never happen? None of us even know if tomorrow will come for us. That's the irony of all of it. None of us know. James said, you know, don't say tomorrow you're going to go to this day, I'm going to go to this city, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. He says, no, you should say, if the Lord is willing, I will do this, and I will do that. Because we don't know what tomorrow holds. We can handle the demands of today as they come without worrying about the unknown future and the things which may or may not happen. None of us know what a day holds. So the simplest thing is, and I say it to myself many times and I don't always practice it, make the most of today. Today is the day. Today is the day that the Lord has given us. Today is the day when his salvation is made known in our lives. So as you go into this week, as you think about all that we've been going through um, as a people, as a nation in the past 12 months, remember these things. Life is more important than material things. Your life is valuable to God. Worrying does not add anything to your life. We can trust God and we can combat worry by learning the art of living one day at a time and by concentrating on the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let's pray together. Lord, forgive us for the times that we want to hold on to everything and we want to control every little detail in our lives and we live as if everything depends on us. But it doesn't. Help us to trust you. Help us to seek you first. Help us to realize what's really important in our lives and help us to realize that we can't change one thing by worrying about it other than maybe we'll change our health and our peace of mind. Help us to trust you. Help us to seek you first. Help us to depend upon your spirit. Give us thankful hearts. Help us to say in our mind when we get up in the morning, this is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. And help us not to worry about tomorrow. Help us not to dwell on the struggles of yesterday. Help us to take this day. Help us to take the next day when we wake up and say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Would you stand together with us as we close in singing?
North, happy Independence Day. May God, the Spirit of God, go with you and be blessed. your name. 